Hello everyone. I'm going to take you through tons of prophetic scriptures today, so hold on to your hats and take notes. This is a continuation of the mystery of the firstborn, and it will also get into some other mysteries of scripture, including the hidden feast, which is the second Passover feast. We'll start today with uh, Exodus chapter 4. Verse 21, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. All of Scripture is prophecy. All of Scripture has been written historically and as a parable. The parable is a story that tells or foretells prophetic truth. You can think of Pharaoh as a type of Satan here and his firstborn son as the Antichrist. Remember that Satan always imitates God. He does not have the creative ability that God has. He cannot do the things that God does. He does not even understand the things that God does. And this is a prophecy of the firstborn son. Israel is God's firstborn son. Who is Israel? Israel is a code word for the overcomers, for those who have striven with God and with men and have overcome. The Bible says that all Israel will be saved. What is that talking about? First and foremost, it's talking about God's Son, God's firstborn son, who will be saved. Of course, that is Jesus Christ first, but it's not limited to Jesus Christ. It's lim it includes all of the overcomers. So there is coming a resurrection of the overcomers. This is the meaning of second Passover. Just as Jesus was resurrected on the day after the Sabbath during the Passover that he was crucified at, he was the first fruits to God who was raised on the day after the Sabbath. So there is coming a second Passover in which the overcomers or what the Bible calls all Israel, will be resurrected on the day after the Sabbath during that second Passover. Now, it just so happens that in two days is second Passover this year. That's Wednesday, May 10th. So the Passover feast would have been celebrated that evening as it changes uh, to May 11th in the Hebrew calendar. And then this coming Saturday would be the Sabbath. And at evening, it becomes the day after the Sabbath. And that would be the day of the resurrection of the overcomers if it was this year. I hope it is. I always hope it is. I've been hoping that for many years now. I don't know if it's this year. I hope it's this year. But I want us to be prepared if it is this year. We should always be prepared. Now, how do we get prepared? We consecrate ourselves before God. Now, in the scripture, the Levites peculiarly represent the firstborn or the overcomers. I want to take you to a scripture in Numbers Numbers chapter 3, verse 40. And the Lord said to Moses, List all the firstborn males of the people of Israel from a month old and upward, taking the number of their names. 
and you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord, instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the people of Israel. So Moses listed all the firstborn among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded him. And all the firstborn males, according to the number of names, from a month old and upward, as listed, were 22,273. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle. The Levites shall be mine. I am the Lord. So the Lord takes the Levites instead of the firstborn. In the Levites we see the mystery of the firstborn. Now, coming back to the idea of second Passover, we only see second Passover celebrated one time in Scripture, and that is with the King Hezekiah in Second Chronicles. Before I go there, though, I, I want to read you where second Passover is introduced in Scripture. This is also in the book of Numbers, and it's Numbers chapter 9. At the beginning of chapter 9, it says that Passover is celebrated. And then there's someone who who came later. Verse 6, it says, And there were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body, so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. So this would be on the 14th day of Nisan, the first uh, month of the Hebrew calendar. And they could not keep the Passover because they were unclean. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. And those men said to him, We are unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the people of Israel? And Moses said to them, Wait, that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If any one of you or of your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall still keep the Passover to the Lord. There were two criteria by which they could not keep the first Passover. They were either unclean or they were gone on a long journey. Why did... God mentioned that at this time. He goes on, In the second month, on the fourteenth day at twilight, they shall keep it. So in other words, not the first month, but the second month. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break any of its bones. According to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. In other words, they have to keep it according to the entire Feast of Unleavened Bread statutes, which is a seven-day feast that begins uh, after the day of Passover. But there's two criteria. Unclean because they had touched a dead body or had been on a long journey. Well, this again is prophetic. It's a parable and it's speaking about things that deal with us. The reality is The overcomers understand that they are unclean because they touch a dead body. They dwell in a dead body. They dwell in the flesh. Jesus said the flesh counts for nothing. Paul said, I consider now no man after the flesh. What does it mean to take the Lord's name in vain? It means that you try to do in the flesh the things of God. And you use God's name or Christ's name to verify what you're doing, saying, oh, this is the Lord's work, or the Lord told me to do this, when in fact the Lord often never told you anything. You just wanted to do it for your own selfish ambition because that's doing it in the flesh. That's the way we are. That's what we do in the flesh. We do things for our own selfish ambition. You know, the overcomers understand that in the flesh is no good thing. They understand that they can't make it in the flesh. The kingdom of God, flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Paul said. What? Look at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, and look who is still outside of New Jerusalem, or heaven, as people like to often say. 
Well, you know, every one of us commit at least one of those sins. And they're outside of New Jerusalem. That means you're outside of New Jerusalem. You're outside of heaven. I'm outside of heaven. I can't make it on my own. That's why Jesus Christ died. That's why he came. That's why it's by grace. Because I can't do it in my flesh. I can't perfectly obey God in my flesh, even though I want to. And I understand that. And it's okay. That's why... God came in the flesh to make a way for us. So I touch a dead body, and I understand that. But what about the second group that have been on a far journey? Well, those are those who have already died, who have already left this flesh. They've been on a far journey. So there are those who have already died, who will take part in the first resurrection, which is that resurrection which comes at the time of second Passover when God finally fulfills second Passover, which I hope is this coming week. If it is this coming week, then it will occur sometime Saturday night, um, this coming Saturday night, which uh, is what date? May... um, 13th, I think. Okay, 2017 is the year. Now, I want to take us now to the scripture that is um, the first and only time in scripture where you actually see a celebration of second Passover. And I'm going to start it a little bit before the second Passover because it's really very, very interesting. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 29, starting in verse 25. And it's talking about Hezekiah. It says, Hezekiah stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet. For the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. Notice that the Levites are musicians here. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Now the priests also were Levites, but it was only of a of the line of Aaron who who actually qualified as the priests, but they were also Levites. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar, and when the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord began also. And the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. When the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed down and worshipped. David and Asaph wrote most of the Psalms that we have in the scripture. So after this, Hezekiah said, You have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. How do they consecrate themselves? Well, they partook of the burnt offering. The burnt offering represents Jesus Christ who sacrificed himself as a whole burnt offering for our sins. So they partook of Jesus Christ in a figure, in a parable. They applied the blood of Jesus to themselves so that they would be considered holy to the Lord. This is how we are consecrated. That's the only way that we can be consecrated. The only way that we are ever acceptable to God. The only way that we can ever come into New Jerusalem. The only way that we can ever come into heaven is by the blood of Christ. So Hezekiah said, You have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all who were of a willing heart 
brought burnt offerings. Now remember, Paul said to offer yourselves a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Do you do that? It's not that you earn your salvation, but do you talk about the Lord when you are with your spouse, with your girlfriend, with your friend? Do you talk about the Lord when you're on the way with your children? Is the Lord always the foremost thing, the first thing on your mind when you wake up? The number of the burnt offerings that the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated offerings were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. But the priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until other priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers the Levites helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. Why does it say that? I think it talks about today. It's a parable prophetically telling us that the time comes when all the priests and the churches are not as holy as the Levites, as those who are going to become the firstborn son of God. It's making a distinction between people who are Levites, who have been chosen to represent the firstborn, and those people who have the official role as a priest, and that very much applies to today. Besides the great number of burnt offerings, there was the fat of the peace offerings, and there were the drink offerings for the burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had prepared for the people, for the thing came about suddenly, suddenly, suddenly the Lord comes to his temple. And so many people think that temple is some temple in Jerusalem that's going to be rebuilt. It's not. I am the temple of God. Are you the temple of God? Have you consecrated your vessel? so that the Holy Spirit will dwell within you? Chapter 30. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. For the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had taken counsel to keep the Passover in the second month. Second month. You're inviting people to come celebrate Passover, but it's the second month and not the first month, like the scripture says. Oh, verse 3, for they could not keep it at that time, at the first month, because the priests had not consecrated themselves in sufficient number, nor had the people assembled in Jerusalem. And the plan seemed right to the king and all the assembly. Now I would really exhort you to read all of chapter 30 because it is extremely profound. But this is the example of the keeping of the second Passover. And now let's go to the book of Malachi. Final book of the Old Testament. Malachi the prophet. Chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, most people think this was fulfilled with Jesus, and it was, but that's not the final fulfillment. Jesus was the first of the first fruits. He was the first of the firstborn of the sons of God. But he's a type of those who come after. 
Malachi 3.2, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So Jesus actually will purify the sons of Levi, those who are called Israel, so that all Israel will be saved, all of the overcomers. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Do you understand that those things have not happened? Jesus came 2,000 years ago. And so far, he has never, ever executed judgment. He has not been a witness against sorcerers or against adulterers or anyone else who has done evil in the world. The reason is because he has been waiting for those, his brothers, to become as he is so that his rule can begin. And that rule is about to begin. Three six. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed, are not destroyed. The purpose of God is to restore. He will judge evil, and the time is coming where the evil is going to be judged. And then those who are judged, and some will have to be executed for the crimes against humanity that they have committed and for the destruction of the earth that they have done. Some people will have to be executed. And then they will have to be restored at a later time, at a later age. Moving now to Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. This is talking about the firstborn sons. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. How long has it been since you have seen a righteous person blessed and been acknowledged and rewarded in this life? The righteous person can't even get a job teaching at a college these days because the wicked rule everywhere. But the time is coming, and now is, when there will again be seen a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Chapter 4 of Malachi. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. How I long for that day. I'm ready. I am ready to take up the rule, the rod of authority. Moving to Revelation chapter 3. 
Revelation chapter 3. No, chapter 2. Verse 25. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who overcomes and who keeps my words until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Back to Malachi 4, verse 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. To the law and to the testimony, if they will not speak according to this, it is because there is no light in them. To the law and to the testimony. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. The overcomers will rule with a rod of iron. The rod of iron is the law of God. It's time that judgment begins. And it will be the law of God that will be executed in the land. And it will be the law of God that condemns evildoers of the evil they have done. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. Father, I pray that you do not have to strike the land with utter destruction. Father, I pray that there will be people who hear that there will be prophetic Elijahs that there will be overcomers who overcome who can bring the word of restoration to this fallen world and who will also bring the righteousness of your judgment upon the evil that now exists Father, I pray that that time is now. I pray that you will arise from your throne. I pray that you will now glorify your saints and be glorified in them, that you will take up your rule and that you will destroy those who destroy the earth in the name of Jesus.